hey, these people don't have the credentials for their jobs. Um, they should be gone. And so there, there is some new activity, but it's joining with activity that was already going on. The prestigious private colleges and universities are almost hopeless. <laughs> this is a shift from the traditional academic view of we are in the pursuit of truth to we are in the pursuit of remaking the country entirely. I'm a firm believer in going forward. I'm a bit of a Nietzschean. Welcome to The Contrarian. I'm David Bernstein. In a world filled with noise, I'm here to provide the signal. And welcome to The Contrarian. I'm your host, David Bernstein. Today, we speak with Jay Shallon. Uh, Jay is somebody that um, I heard on a, a YouTube interview show of some kind and thought, wow, this is a real expert on higher education. Somebody who's been following these trends, not just since December when those university presidents came on and changed the conversation, but for many, many years, really thinking deeply about policy implications. So Jay, I really appreciate you being on with us. Thank you, Dave. I think it was December 5th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, three university presidents go before the U.S. Congress, and they make some remarks that stirred a lot of controversy. And since then, there seems to be a new conversation on higher education. What do you make of the current moment or the moment since December 5th? Oh boy. Um, you know, cause I don't really, I've been involved for so long. That's just uh, one of many, you know, mm -hmm. I'm down here in North Carolina. We had uh, situations where we had a uh, beloved civil war statue torn down and, We've had all kinds of things. There, I mean, the December 5th thing has brought, at least at Harvard, it brought a new awareness of um, uh, the need to mind where your money is going by many of the alumni. I think there's, there's greater alumni uh, involvement. But see, for, that is something that has actually been happening over the last three years. It's the uh, for Alumni Free Speech Association, which may be up over 20 fairly prestigious colleges, including I'm very familiar with their activities at Davidson and Washington and Lee. And I know somebody who's involved up at Cornell. So um yeah, it, it, it spurred part of the world, but into a little bit more action and more desire to look upon higher ed uh, with discriminating eyes, sort of. Um, but this is something that has been growing. I came to the Martin Center, I think it was 17 years ago. The Martin Center uh, is a um, think tank in, kind of a think and do tank in Raleigh, North Carolina that um, pushes for reform of higher education. And when I came here 17 years ago, the wind was at my face. The wind was at our face. Nothing was happening. Today, the wind's getting a little bit behind our back. There are events that are happening um, throughout higher ed, both before and after this event, it, I guess they held it at Penn, was it? Um, but the event with uh, that, that spurred the events at Harvard, you know, getting rid of the president and looking now they're doing things that should have been done many years ago, such as looking into uh, some of the people involved and, and they're noticing, hey, these people don't have the credentials for their jobs. Um, they should be gone. And so there, there is some new activity, but it's joining with activity that was already going on, I would say. That's helpful context. Um, so, you know, you're looking at obviously some very deep seated problems in higher education that, you know, you've been obviously following for a long time. A lot of other people who might have 
just paid attention to December 5th um, or, or knew that there were problems sort of in a vague sense, but didn't have an understanding of how deeply rooted they were. Help us out. How would you characterize the rot, if that's the term you would use? Uh, incredibly deep. Um, I would say that I often categorize there are four different cases here. One is um, private schools, private colleges and universities. And the prestigious private colleges and universities are almost hopeless. <laughs> um, they have massive endowments. The, their rot is incredibly deep as far as their politicization is incredibly deep. They have ties with the government that uh, give them special privileges. Um, they're very, that's a, that's a very difficult problem. The lesser prestigious private schools, there is a, a lever. They are open to market forces. They're very dependent on uh, tuition. So if they're not pleasing the population, they're struggling. That, that's the case for the majority of private schools. They're not the big names that everybody has heard of. They're the little religious schools and so on. Um, but there's some hope for them. Then there's the public universities. In the case of blue states, I don't see a whole lot of uh, reform happening there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the Rutgers or in New Jersey or University of Massachusetts at Amherst. The lever there is the public and the public is very satisfied with the left. But then there is the most hopeful case of all. And um, that is the public colleges and universities in red states. And they are very subject to the political climate and when I came here, uh, North Carolina was a solidly blue state. Um, the entire hierarchy at the University of North Carolina was solidly to the left or left center. The board of governors that controls the whole system, the system president, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill's chancellor, who was the top executive there, and so forth down the line. We're all to the left. Today, uh, North Carolina has become a purple state leaning far towards into the red zone, you know. Um, so at that one campus at the University of Chapel Hill, the chancellor is now a uh, solid conservative Republican. The provost is a sort of a centrist Republican. The system president is a centrist Republican. And the uh, Board of Governors is solidly Republican with some strong conservatives there. So I have some hope that we can uh, maybe scrape out a lot of the rot. It's not going to be easy. There's the uh, soft governance versus hard governance problem. You can make the rules and the uh, people up top can make decisions. But sometimes the faculty may decide just not to carry them out and uh, dare um, the higher-ups to do something about it. So it's going to be a long period of trench warfare, but I believe that I'm hopeful in that case and some of the others. What are the ideological, political trends that brought us to this current moment? Why do we have the rot? Where, what's the source of that's that? A, that's a long question. Um, give me your give me your sh your Reader's Digest version answer. You want the bumper sticker, but uh, the Reader's Digest is a long one. But there were really three. The rot came in three directions. Initially, uh, back in the late 1800s, a lot of professors became progressives. Um, there was the Darwin versus. Uh, scripture battle going on that was like the initial battle over academic freedom. And so the progressives who were on the scientific side kind of battled with the boards of the boards of trustees and other boards, and they actually won. Um, 
And they were very science-based. Um, you know, they believed that they could recreate the world according to scientific methods. And so that was their whole push. Um, unfortunately, all they really did was undermine the culture. But by the early 1920s, I would say close to a majority of academics in this country who were not explicitly religious were progressive. Then you had um, the actual party communist influence. Um, of course, World War I, you had uh, the Russian Revolution and the very brief Hungarian takeover, uh, a communist takeover. And um, so at some point, the Russians, the, the Soviets, started funding espionage in the United States. And they also were funding professors to uh, subvert, indoctrinate, undermine our society. In many, by early 1950s, at the height of McCarthyism, there were some defectors from the communist cause. And they estimated in, in their, into their uh, testimony to Hueck or to McCarthy, um, they estimated that there were roughly 1,500 to 3,500 academics who had solid ties to either the Soviets or the American Communist Party. Now, only about a couple of hundred of them got booted out in that, in that early 1950s period, or mid-1950s period. So that left, you know, another 1,300, 3,000, somewhere of people who basically went underground. You know, they continued to subvert, and they didn't, you know, they, they burned their Communist Party cards and kept things. They were there. Their beliefs were the same. Some of their activities were maybe curtailed, but they were still acting. The big thing was culture, the cultural Marxism. And after World War I, uh, a lot of the, communi the true Marxist communists were very disappointed because they expected the soldiers, the blue collar working man soldiers to turn their guns on their upper class and bourgeois uh, officers. And have, they, they were expecting the great revolution of the proletariat. It didn't happen. What they realized is we've got to do something. These people are just too tied to their traditions. They're too tied to their culture. They're too tied to their identity. So we have to undermine, we have to prepare the ground for the revolution. And so I guess the main thrust of this came from the Frankfurt School. Um, it was kind of suggested, initiated by the former undersecretary of education in the Belakun communist government in Hungary. But Anyway, the, the Frankfurt School of Social Research was formed at um, Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany, and they operated there for a few years. And then with the rise of uh, Hitler, they moved to first to Britain and then to the United States. Their initial home in the United States was Columbia University. They were looking at media, education, and how to get into the institutions to start to affect this undermining of the culture and traditions and identity that Westerners had that prevented them from joining the uh, revolution of the proletariat. I, I think the, a German communist who was famous in the 1960s, Rudy Dutschke, came up with a phrase uh, the long, long march. march through the institutions. And so the Frankfurt School and their hangers-on and followers and adherents uh, have been doing that. And so then you have intellectual things going on. Um, we went from modernity, which you can kind of, the Enlightenment, that was called the epistemological term in which 
the scientific method became, and, and other such things, the uh, rationalism of Descartes became the standards for what is real and what is true. Uh, then in the late, close to 1800, uh, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant wrote about how, wait a minute, there's a component of our perception of reality that comes from within us. And this brought about a, a great number of people looking at the subjective side of reality rather than just looking at it, the empirical to decide what is true and what is not. They there are limitations to the empirical side. And so um, we came around to uh, the philosopher Nietzsche. You got uh, a focus on truth seemed to change over history. Um, it changed according to the person who was interpreting things. And there was a general move towards relativism. Then mm -hmm. in the 20th century, you got this what's called the turn towards linguistics or turn towards language. And to, to give the bumper sticker thing, um, in lots of academia, um, reality started to be sort of conceived of as language dependent. So you have all this stuff going on. You have cultural changes. You know, the beat generation was bringing the lifestyle of the European avant-garde to the United States are popularizing it and also Americanizing it. And all this stuff, uh, I, I have a quote here from Hillary Clinton, you know, we're certain at her, uh, I guess it was her thesis or it was a speech at uh, Wellesley, you know, in which she said, we're searching for a more immediate, ecstatic and penetrating modes of living. Um, and this was the sort of cultural zeitgeist of the American, high-level American campus, the prestigious campuses that would have great influence in the 1960s. And so, yeah, welcome to the 1960s, uh, where things pretty much went crazy. Um, and there was kind of this marriage of the collapse of tradition, culture, identity, and a very subversive political agenda on the other hand. There, there are many writers who've discussed this. Um, one is um, uh, Robert Nisbet, who was a sociologist in the mid 20th century, who he realized that as people kind of got cut off from their traditional communities, they would look for community elsewhere. And these Cultural Marxists were all too happy to provide them with a home. And so mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of this going on. You have uh, all these new programs and departments opening up. You have all the studies programs, women's mm -hmm. studies, African-American studies, uh, gender studies, Hispanic studies. And then you have things like post-colonialism and critical race theory. And this is a shift from the traditional academic view of we are in the pursuit of truth to we are in the pursuit of remaking the country entirely. And uh, so it's, it was a political agenda. Jay, Jay I want to, um, uh, yeah, I want to ask you about that. So if in your in your view, what would you restore? Would you restore the, the, this function of academia to pursue the truth, um, sort of using the scientific method? Or would you pursue, because you, you, it seemed in the beginning when you were talking about sort of, you had this sort of religious role of universities that gave way to a more scientific role of universities. And I was wondering, and, and that, that changed the culture, but would you want to revert back to the religious role of universities or would you want to reverse, revert back to the to the rationalist mode of universities? Neither. Um, I'm a firm believer in going forward. I'm a bit of a Nietzschean. Um, so, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, I do, uh, I, I feel that, okay, we traveled that road. There were good things about that road and bad things about that road. But we can't go back there. The world that exists 
is no longer that. You cannot have a 19, or 18th century uh, the United States. The demographic is a changed. The, right. the um, technology has changed. Everything's changed. You can't go back. You have to go forward. And we have to go, I believe that we have to go forward with many of the philosophical observations that led to the problems uh, in mind. Um, there's another quote of Nietzsche's. He describes how we're now at sea. We don't have any guideposts to guide us. And, um, you know, take care, little ship is kind of how he, and that's kind of, we are entering new country or new territory. My belief is Nietzsche was giving a warning, like proceed cautiously here. You don't have the guideposts of the past. You're no longer on that firm, solid land that uh, Christianity provided. Um, so, or you're no longer on that solid land that uh, the pure science of the early enlightenment provided. So proceed cautiously. That's my take on it. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, a whole lot of other people decided, you know, yippee, we have no constraints. We can do whatever we want. So you have to go forward with what you have. And what mm -hmm. we have had is we've had new ideas, some of which are good, a great many which are god awful. Maybe I'm more optimistic than you about Univer public universities in blue states, perhaps because I think what happens in red states could eventually affect the way others see it. Perhaps because I'm in a blue state and I'm starting to perceive many of the people around me understand the liberalism that has taken over in their own political camp, and and I'm I'm um, I'm somewhat optimistic that that could actually sh shift gears over long term. To me, this is a generational tr struggle, not something that's going right. to happen tomorrow, next year, even. But but I, I can I can conjure up. Um, a future in which a more moderate academia starts to take hold, and and I, but I want to I want to sort of lay out what what it would take to get there, um, and you know I I see the sort of sources of inertia you've written I know extensively about the role education schools have played I mean to me that's a juggernaut like I don't know how we overcome that also I know you've spoken about board of trustees and the role they have played or that they could play why don't we actually start there because I've I've actually I've talked to a lot of really smart people who are looking to this but I've never asked anybody to date what they think the role of board of trustees can be in in this what do you think okay well first of all. It's not about a single bullet. It's about creating an environment. Um, yeah. And, but with boards, I really, I think it's time for them to get aggressive. In a lot of the, and in, in red states, they have exceptionally powerful allies in the legislatures. Public universities, they have, their charters say that they are there to serve the public to serve the state. That's first and foremost. Um, and so they, and boards derive their power in states from the, le in public schools from the legislature. So they've got some very powerful allies, but even in their traditional documents, they have power they're not using. They've just kind of pulled back. Um, there's this tremendous asymmetry of information problem in higher education in which the, uh, the administration and the faculty know everything that's going on on that campus. And here you've got these part-time guys from the, largely from the business world who are not familiar at all. And they're just, you know, they can be easily manipulated. Um, but they do have powers such as like, uh, it did, it differs in every institution, every state, but they have powers of a review over hiring, over promotion and tenure, and these kinds of things. A famous case um, a few years ago was the case of Stephen Salida at the University of Illinois. Um, he was a, uh, I think, an indigenous studies professor, which that throws a few red flags. Um, and he made comments about like, 
how good it was that a couple of Israeli teenagers were kidnapped and killed and some really like fighting words sort of things that in the academic freedom world, there is an exception if somebody appears to be unfit for the job of professor, you can get rid of them, you know, if you're crazy. Um, and this, this kind of fell in the category of not being fit. Now, he was trying to get a new job at the university, at the flagship at the University of Illinois. He had been at Virginia Tech. And um, the president decided, oh, my God, if, I hire, if we hire this guy, our Jewish donors are going to run for the hills. And so she talked the board into uh, using their power of review to deny this guy a position all within, you know, the rights articulated in the, their, you know, uh, original documents and within the, uh, it, and it fits into the scheme of academic freedom. So the boards do have lots of power that they're not using. They have allowed themselves to be shoved into a corner and, you know, mine the finances, do some fundraising, and we'll give you tickets to the football game. But, but why? Why did so many of these board of trustees sort of take a back seat as these ideological trends were dominating university cultures? Um, there's uh, certainly uh, all kinds of things in play. Um, one of them is the nature of uh, trustees, which you think about it, they're very conformist. These are, these are people who have made very often made their way up large hierarchies. They've been very conformist. And so that's part of their nature. They don't rock mm -hmm. the boat. A lot of them are just socialite types. You know, they're there for the tickets. And it's kind of an easy, <laughs> easy, fun thing to do. And so they're not, it's only recently that we've been seeing the firebrands, the ones who do want to fight back. Um, right. So that is, and also um, in red states, in uh, in private colleges, a lot of times they will have self-perpetuating boards that are essentially controlled by the administration. So mm -hmm. they're, they're in an infinite loop of hiring people just like, or um, appointing people just like themselves. So there's no ability to change there. Um, but we, we are now starting to see this, and I would like to see them get really aggressive. Uh, I, there's been a tradition of Boards take a neutral approach to politics when they're making decisions like personnel decisions. And I think this is wrong. I think that their mandate to serve the people of their state or their institution supersedes their feelings of wanting to be not involved in the politics. Um, at North University of North Carolina, they've hired a guy who's been arrested a bunch of times for violence at protests. He's waved guns around and he belongs to a, to an anarchist group that has it's just uh, called Redneck Revolt, where they practice with firearms and it's like a militia. This guy gets hired. Um, they could. The trustees could have looked at that and said, you know, maybe not. You know, and it's not a matter of we only want Republicans. It's a matter of we don't think this person who is an extreme radical is going to serve the needs of the people of the state. Therefore, we're going to deny his appointment or her appointment. And so they can start taking some very aggressive moves like that. Um, we need better. We also need much better trustee training right now. Trustees are generally trained by the administration. Well, the administration tells them, look, your job is to stay in your lane and let us run the day to day. And, you know, you stay over in your corner and we'll and we'll make sure you get good seats. Um, another thing is boards need their own source of information that is not 
it all depended on the administration. Mm -hmm. And and a policy level person who um, can look into things and can maybe look at a professor's uh, social media, a prospective professor's social Mm -hmm. media or their CV, uh, whatever, their past and say, this guy's got some red flags. We need to look at him closer or, you know, say, oh, no, they're fine. Uh, somebody who can ju- another another thing I would like to see boards do is I'd like to take them see them take firmer control over the general education programs. At one time, I think the University of North Carolina had close to two thousand potential courses in their uh, in their general education program. Whereas those you, I mean, you have you know 10, 12 courses to make sure that students have really essential knowledge. Mm -hmm. But instead, you know, they're out there taking, uh, instead of taking, you know, American history or world history, they're taking history of snacks to satisfy their, uh, (laughs) you know, history requirement in the general education program. So, um, you know, th- these are a whole Unfortun- bunch. Of- Unfortunately, I don't need a course on that. But okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. well, um, you know, I'm there too. Um, I can right. probably teach it. Um, right. <laughs> but uh, right. so, so th- um, there's a long laundry list of changes that boards could make that will advance the Im- the improve the environment. Let's say and start to push back, start to gain ground and maybe reduce the politicization that has occurred. Yeah. So I want to also get your perspective on the sort of rise of the administrative campus. Like all of a sudden, the number of administrators, and I don't remember the figures, although I've seen them multiple times, you know, we went from having, you know, a small number of administrators to huge, huge administrative bureaucracies on college campuses. I, I, want, to, I want to ask you two questions. Um, one, um, why did that happen? And um, and two, how how big of a problem is it? It's huge. Um, when you think about, uh, yeah, there's a. Uh, at some schools, there are more staff members than there are faculty, mm-hmm. uh, which should not be. Yeah, there's some minor things like the faculty pulled back from doing administrative duties. They used to do student advising. Well, now we have student advising department. They right. used to, way back, they used to, usually there'd be one professor living in a dorm, uh, you know, and now <laughs> we have a whole residential life department. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's so, but really what caused it is money. Um, money and accreditation Um, But mostly money. Uh, Universities have been flush with money. They've uh, just been getting money thrown at them from many different ways. Tuitions keep rising, have kept rising. And so they were able to hire these people. They they were they didn't they didn't have to make cuts. Um, Now, I know that. As a faculty member, you're kind of like, wait, we've had cuts all along. But the general trend has been, uh, let's just expand the staff. It makes the administrators, the top administrators, more powerful because now they have more employees, so they're in favor of it. And um, it's been disastrous, I think, because if you look at the nature of who are a lot of these staff members. And a lot of times they're rather unremarkable owners of not very demanding uh, bachelor's degrees. You know, the, the, the classic midwit, um, so to speak, you know, above average intelligence, but, um, and uh, so they, many, because they're like this, they have swallowed the Kool-Aid taught by the faculty. And so in many cases, they're further to the left than the faculty. Right, right. So I've heard the almost opposite interpretation of this too. And I want to run this by you. I've heard people say, well, look, 
the you know, universities are in a very competitive environment and they're trying to attract students. Students are now the consumers. And as a result, they're they're trying to they're creating sort of a therapeutic experience yes. for their their students. Isn't that but but that would suggest that they're not flush with money and can do everything that they can, that they need the uh, the inflow of resources in order to make their their students happy. Um, the lust for money um, doesn't diminish with more money. Um, mm-hmm. so, sure, that is true. <laughs> and, and, you know, there are, once again, we're talking different campuses. The uh, non-prestigious private schools, they're just s- scraping by. And so they have mm-hmm. not quite gone in this field, although they have that profession, uh, they have that pressure. Um, schools do so many more things than they used to. Um, back when... Uh, I was a lad, uh, you know, the uh, health department at a college or university, you know, some nurse had a few Band-Aids and aspirin and uh, (laughs) anything more serious than that, you went to the emergency room at the local hospital. Um, Today, they're asked to do all kinds of, I mean, uh, asked to give medications, they're asked to provide psychological counseling, so on and so forth. And so, yes, there there are all these student services that have arisen. Um, So, yeah, I mean, it's been for a lot of different reasons. Mm. Yeah. So with the time we have left, I wanted to ask you, I know that in a number of universities, including, I believe, in University of North Carolina, there are these new centers for civic thought, the sort of alternative bastions of traditional rationalists liberal arts teaching and humanities teaching. Um, and it, it seems to me, correct me if you think I'm wrong about it, that that is actually a very hopeful sign. It's not existing. It, it's not emerging everywhere to the same degree, but that that could become an alternative source of, of a alternative model, maybe something akin to what used to exist. And that that could overtake over time, the uh, sort of grievance studies programs and the rest, because it'll attract better professors and better students. And it will over time change the campus environment. What do you, what do you make of that? Um, I'm in total agreement. Uh, I've written about that extensively. Um, Yes, they, these, it gives, for one thing, it gives donors some control over where their money goes, you know, uh, the, mm-hmm. Before these centers became common in the aughts, there was uh, people were conservative donors were trying to endow chairs mm. to conservative professors. But that professor retires or goes somewhere else, and it would be left to somebody, maybe in the, the department head or somebody else, would make the next appointment. And so this donation that was intended to bring conservative thought onto campus would wind up funding a leftist professor. (laughs) Um, So this takes a lot of the control out of the hands of the department, out of the faculty, and puts it in the hands of donors. Um, I know that there are some of the major uh, donors and other think tanks have people who will help donors structure their um, donations. So yeah, this is a tremendous way to, um, and I've known, I've known so many young uh, faculty members who are conservative, who uh, they spend two or three years bouncing around these centers before they land a permanent job. And so every young conservative professor I know is actually working. Uh, So these are, you know, these are very valuable places. They bring ideas on. They uh, enable like a cluster of uh, faculty to do combined research. Um, they can bring speakers. They, they're, they're, they are a very hopeful model. And I would also say that we have noticed also an increase in the number of startup colleges. Tiny little startup colleges, very often religious, but there were very few throughout like the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And in the last 20 years or so, maybe 30 years, there's been a big upswing, you know, not huge. You know, we're, we're still talking, uh, you know, 20. But um, 
this is also something hopeful because these are um, some of them are quite a few of them are in the Hillsdale Grove City model where they don't take federal money. So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of little hopeful things, you know, they're kind of like the uh, rodents nibbling on the dinosaur eggs or whatever. Um, we are different people. Um, they are all about power. They seek power. That's their, that's their whole life is how do I get more power? How do I change this society? You know, I want the power to change society. How do we get it? Well, we have to undermine the society first. We're the, the conservative or mainstream world, I don't know, is a little more concerned. How do we make things work? You know, we're a little bit more willing. We have historically been much more willing to make concessions and compromises to make things workable. That's that's always been the uh, kind of the Achilles heel of uh, the political right in this country. And so, um, <clears throat> yes, we should uh, we should be more aggressive. We should say, okay, we are now dealing with people whose only concern is taking power, and. Whoever has the power gets to decide how this society is going to operate. So we're taking the power. That's right. Now, you know, and that's the uh, the debate around sort of Chris Rufo and his approach. There was this epic debate between Chris Rufo, Rufo and Yashka Monk on Barry Weiss's podcast recently about sort of the varying approaches within the quote unquote anti-woke movement. And, and, you know, on the one hand, you have sort of the you have sort of the center left um, intellectual who does not like um, radical left-wing ideology at all, doesn't, wants to be able to explore ideas, wants to, wants to be in a, you know, in a rationalist milieu. The Robert um, Kennedy wing? Um, yeah, no, I'm talking about, I think that there are, maybe, maybe, that, that, I think Robert Kennedy occupies a different place in the political uh, sphere, but um, I'm talking about people like, these are, these are left-wing academics, mostly or center-left academics who, who, who want to be able to argue and talk about policy and differences in approaches and, and, and debate. I mean, I, I'm more of that camp than I am probably in, in your, in your political camp. That said, that said, and then there's the Rufo wing, which is saying, look, They've seized power. We're going to have to use power in order to restore some semblance sure. of, of of moderation and rationality into the system. But but do you worry at all that that will create its own form of a liberalism? In other words, ultimately, the people who are pushing back against the postmodernist rot that we're talking about may actually have their own agenda, which is completely different and is also might not lead to more a more sane yeah. academic system. I, what is your thought? I do worry um, there is a certain religious fundamentalism that on the right that sometimes concerns me. Um, there's also, um, but um, there's, it, it's not like we have the um, freedom to not push back. Um, we have to, it's, it's, mm -hmm. we can't, even the status quo is terrible. You know, it's not, even if we right. just hold the line, it's terrible. Um, I'm right. very much a free speech advocate. I'm very much uh, an open inquiry advocate. I personally, this is something that would probably make some heads explode, but I believe that, uh, you know, at public universities at least, and maybe at the universities, the private universities that purport to be free speech universities. Uh -huh. You know, they they claim that they're open inquiry, free speech. Um, I would like to have professors, new hires, sign a loyalty oath. But the loyalty oath to, would be to um, respecting free inquiry. Mm -hmm. And in that way... So not a, not a DEI statement. <laughs> no, 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 no. In that way, you put this kind of uh, free ability to explore, to argue, to have different opinions. You put that front and center in somebody's employment. You put that front and center in the university. And um, 
I, you know, uh, th- I would not be against that. In fact, I've kind of proposed it and got some eyes rolled at me. But uh, yeah, I, let me let me just say from I think from a branding and marketing perspective, not that you're in that business or should be that the, the word loyalty. I, oh, is yeah. right, right. I mean, I think that there's a, I think it's a great concept, a statement of principles of academic inquiry might bring people around a little quicker. Yeah, but, uh, I, it's a fascinating uh, idea. Yeah, no, I, I I I agree with that. It's not a marketing, but uh, it 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 says exactly what it is. Um, yeah, but yeah, there's, I understand and agree. Yeah, I want to preserve that because uh, you know I'm a free thinker, um, right? And I want to preserve that is the that is the very best thing about the American university is that it is has had a generally free created a free environment for exploration. And um, I, I would like to really nail that down. Yeah. Look, Jay, it's we're coming upon, um, you know, the, the end here. And I, I want to say, like, I think you know as much or more about this than anybody I've talked to. I would love an opportunity to, to bring you back on and talk about uh, some of these issues in greater depth. So um, I really appreciate it. And I, I'm, I'm, I've read some of your writing, but I have more to read. Um, so and I'm going to uh, post some of your writing on links to uh, the, in the show notes of this podcast. Awesome. But I. I really appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us. Well, thank you, David. Uh, this was, I had a really good time. <laughs> it was, it's good to, it's good to look back over 17 years. I'm semi-retired now. And so I'm not as involved as I once was. So I'm losing a little, but it was really good to look back over 17 years of what's going on and uh, kind of get my ideas back together again. So. I enjoyed Great. it well, I'm glad you. I'm, I'm glad you did. Thank you for tuning in to The Contrarian. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to rate our podcast on Apple and Spotify. Stay connected with us on social media for more updates. Until next time, keep challenging. <laughs>